Good afternoon. I'd like to thank my colleagues for joining me in convening this important joint committee, uh, subcommittee hearing. Unfortunately, Chairman Poe couldn't join us today, but I know he's very interested and engaged on the many challenges presented to the U.S. policymakers in Pakistan. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that his opening statement be inserted for the record. And without objection, the hearing record will uh, remain open for five business days to allow for further statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record subject to the length limitation in the rules. As we all know, the United States has spent tens of billions in taxpayer dollars in the form of aid to Pakistan since 9-11, all in the hope that Pakistan would become a partner in the fight against terrorism. Unfortunately, despite this significant investment, Pakistani military and intelligence services are still linked to terrorist groups. While the administration and the Pakistanis argue that there have been some successes in the fight against terrorist elements, particularly in Shawal Valley, terrorist organizations with close ties to Pakistan's military elite uh, have been left untouched to the point of thriving, while Pakistan's government uh, governing elite turns a blind eye. Today we will we'll discuss the administration's policy toward Pakistan and take a closer look at U.S. goals, expectations, and options with Pakistan. The U.S.-Pakistan relationship has always been complicated. Pakistan is an important country of over 200 million people. It has nuclear capabilities and is strategically located with important neighbors, including China, India, and Afghanistan. But this country poses challenges that have plagued the United States for decades. Given its significance, we can't afford to be spontaneous with our policy toward Pakistan, and there could, uh, there could be far-reaching consequences. At the same time, many of us in Congress are unwilling to continue down this same failed path that consists of stacks of USA dollars without much support in the fight against terrorists to show for it. To be frank, Pakistan likes the United States for, uh, because for decades we've given them a substantial amount of aid, especially to the Pakistani military, while they hope, uh, they hope that they can prevent us from getting too close with India. The United States tolerates Pakistan because it claims to be in the fight with us on the global war on terror. Recent history shows us that while Pakistan is getting money and weapons, U.S. goals in the war on terror are sadly lacking, and Pakistan may, in fact, be using the assets we provide them to undermine some of our strategic diplomatic efforts in the region. Pakistan claims to be fighting terrorism, but they refuse to fight some groups who we know to be terrorists. Many observers see Pakistani forces as selective in the terrorist group it fights, leaving a Pakistani force, uh, leaving others to continue to wreak havoc, especially when those, uh, those groups target India. Let us not forget that Pakistan was less than helpful in the hunt and ultimate demise of Osama bin Laden, and to this day they are holding Dr. Shaquille Afridi uh, under arrest, a hero to our country for aiding in bin Laden's capture. Patience is growing very thin. The recent failure to get consensus of, on proposed F-16 sale is evidence of the newly endemic weariness where Pakistan is concerned. If our current efforts in Pakistan are not producing the results we seek, then what are our options? We could simply turn the money off, saving taxpayers billions of dollars. We could enforce sanctions or designate Pakistan as a state sponsor of terrorism. Sanctions were used in the 90s, but without much effect. I hope to hear from our witnesses as to what sort of stick and carrot approach we might actually work with uh, Pakistan so we can get, have a strategic partnership on uh, issues of mutual interest. Fifteen years have passed since 9-11. Billions of dollars have been spent and far too little, little change has occurred in Pakistan. Should we continue our failed policy and attempt to convince ourselves that Pakistan will one day see eye to eye? with the United States, or should we look at the U.S.-Pakistan relationship through a new lens? I look forward to today's constructive discussion to guide our policy efforts with Pakistan, and I uh, turn to the ranking member, Mr. Sherman, for any comments that he might have. Thank you. We have relations with, uh, I think, well, close to 200 countries. The default position is we don't give them money. So those who suggest uh, aid to Pakistan have got to show that there's a strong justification for doing so. The evidence uh, is not encouraging. 
General Musharraf spoke on television in February about how Pakistan supported, uh, provided support for uh, Lashkar uh, uh, Tiboa, um, also known as LET, and to the uh, JEM, and essentially said terrorism was fine as long as it's directed at India. His remarks didn't provoke much of a reaction because much of the power structure in Pakistan agrees with him. The Pakistani government, as our chairman just pointed out, continues to hold Dr. Afridi. So not only do they shelter bin Laden, they punish those who helped us unshelter bin Laden. And the military establishment in Pakistan stokes uh, paranoia about India, meddles in Afghanistan, and seems to be trying to weaken Afghanistan uh, so as to have a divided, pushed on population. Regardless of how we answer the friend or foe question, our relationship with Pakistan is important. But keep in mind, you'd think we would only provide aid to those countries where we don't have to ask the question, friend or foe. But Pakistan is a nation of 180 billion people with a history of terrorist activities, 100 uh, nuclear weapons, a very confused body politic. The administration is requesting uh, money for Pakistan in a number of different accounts, including 740 uh, million of assistance um, on the civilian side, 265 million on the military side, and uh, uh, aid in other categories as well. Um, you would think that we would at least condition a large portion of this aid on the re release of Dr. Freedy and his family. Providing more assistance to a government that has supported terrorists and has shown itself not very capable or serious about combating ser uh, terrorism um, may not be the very best use of taxpayer money. We should be looking to reorient the money we do spend. I'd like to focus on three things, uh, human rights, education, and public diplomacy. First, the Pakistani government has a uh, regrettable record of um, uh, oppressing some of the major components of its country, uh, large minorities, including uh, the Sindh and the Baluch. Uh, free speech and political dialogue are restricted. Extrajudicial killings are common. For example, uh, Anwar Lagaria, the brother of a dear friend of mine, was assassinated in Sindh just last year, and the Pakistani government was had closed the file. I want to thank our State Department for at least raising the question. They've reopened the file, but that doesn't mean they'll actually do anything. A country with blasphemy laws is just begging uh, individuals to claim that minorities have said this or that, unprovable, and then ex impose uh, terrible penalties on someone they happen to dislike. It's no surprise that extremism flourishes in this environment. Second, education. Uh, Pakistan must uh, reform its education uh, system. Many textbooks uh, contain content that perpetuates minority stereotypes and feeds as, uh, support for Islamic extremism. Uh, a lack of a government-funded school, uh, schools has led to an increasingly number of extremist madrasas. In Sindhi, uh, in Sindh, and other places in Pakistan, girls are often denied education. Uh, as I proposed, uh, I think at our last hearing, uh, what if we do provide aid, we ought to provide free textbooks, so that parents don't have that burden, aren't tempted to send their kids to a madrasa, and so that the textbooks, while they may not uh, reflect a all red, white, and blue values uh, will at least not contain material that would be an anathema to the American people. And finally, it's very hard for corrupt people to steal textbooks, especially in a country where the textbooks are made free by the American people. Um, I'd li uh, I uh, uh, co-chair the Cindy Caucus, and so I focused on southern Pakistan in particular. Um, and um, I uh, am have worked to make sure that we communicate to Sindh and other parts of Pakistan through Voice of America in the language people speak in their homes. The importance of Pakistan is, seems to be so overwhelming that we spend billions of dollars giving it to a government that supports terrorism 
but we don't spend a million and a half dollars broadcasting in uh, the Cindy language. Um, what a bizarre approach. What a pro-Islamabad approach. Um, what an approach that does not match America's interests. Uh, finally, if we're going to win over the uh, uh, Muslim world, um, we need to have the State Department maybe hire one or few people, fewer people that are experts in the 1800s European diplomacy and hire at least one person whose job description says understand the Quran, the Hadith. Uh, you don't have to write a fatwa, but you should have read a thousand of them. Uh, to think that we are waging a war for the minds of Muslims around the world and haven't hired a single person because of their understanding of that religion and how it is used and how it is misused shows a, uh, uh, an insular thinking in a um, bureaucracy that prizes an understanding of the machinations of Metronik in European diplomacy two centuries ago. I yield back. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I know we've got other vote series coming up on the floor very soon. Um, I'll just uh, yield one more uh, slot before we go to the witnesses, to the ranking member of the Subcommittee on uh, Terrorism, Nonproliferation, and Trade, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Salmon, for conducting this hearing. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Robacher and uh, who is here, I guess, uh, and Mr. Poe as well. But Ranking Member Sherman, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, all the members that took the time to be here in this important hearing. Of course, I'd like to thank our panel uh, for being here to discuss the topic at hand, Pakistan. Since 9-11, the United States' relationship with Pakistan has ebbed and flowed. Over the last decade and a half, several missteps have taken both sides uh, uh, into uh, controversy, and including instances of miscommunication, competing national interest, and fundamental failure to broaden and deepen the relationship as a whole. Indeed, it seems that the two countries trend toward a one-dimensional, transactional relationship centered along security concerns instead of a broad partnership that includes trade and cultural linkages uh, is something that uh, is problematic. However, over the last few years, even these security concerns have not equated to a smooth relationship. While, Ist is while Islamabad has helped the United States capture and kill numerous Al-Qaeda members, including several senior leaders in its support for groups like uh, Taliban, the Haqqani Network, uh, Lashkari uh, Taliban, uh, these things undermine critical U.S. national security interest. Further complicating uh, the issue is the fact that both leaders of the Taliban were killed or died within Pakistani borders. And the former head uh, of al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, was also killed in Pakistan, only miles from the country's capital. There's little reason to suggest that Pakistan is going to change its strategic calculus. It's critical that we vigorously consider our relationship with Pakistan and recognize that Islamabad is, willing, is a willing and able partner in certain areas while hostile in others. To be sure, accepting this paradigm does not mean abandoning Pakistan altogether. At stake in the region are some of America's most vital national security interests, including ensuring that neither Afghanistan nor Pakistan serves as a safe haven for global terrorists, keeping Pakistan's nuclear weapons out of the hands of terrorists, and preventing war between India and Pakistan that could potentially go nuclear. These interests warrant continued outreach and cooperation with Islamabad. To that end, the United States should consider a more balanced approach when supplying aid, an approach that favors education and economic aid over military assistance. The provision of U.S. weapons cannot reshape Pakistan's will to maintain its militant proxies on its western border. But those weapons do equip Pakistan to challenge India on its eastern border. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and see how uh, we can shape this relationship to the benefit of both countries. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. We're grateful to be joined today by Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad. Appreciate you being here, Ambassador. And uh, Mr. Bill Roggio, appreciate you being here. And Tricia Bacon. And uh, Ambassador, we'll yield the first uh, time to you. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the ranking member, the Chairman of the 
Terrorism Subcommittee and all the distinguished members who are here. I appreciate the opportunity to appear and to uh, make uh, a few comments on a very important and difficult subject, uh, the issue of Pakistan. Uh, as you said, Chairman, it requires a deliberate but frank discussion and analysis of where we are and where we need to go. I have prepared a testimony, but uh, which I submit for the record. Uh, Without objection, your formal testimony will be injected into the record. I would like to summarize that testimony by making a few points uh, and look forward to the discussion. Uh, while Pakistan, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, did provide significant help in the overthrow of the Taliban and in the uh, capture of quite a number of uh, al-Qaeda members, I think it's uh, fair to say that if one focuses on Afghanistan, which would be the, the burden of my comments uh, today, uh, uh, looking at Pakistan, one concludes uh, uh, now the following, that first, Pakistan is now a state sponsor of terror. Uh, there is no question that the Pakistani military and the Pakistani intelligence agency, the ISI, the inter-service uh, agency, supports the Akhani network, uh, uh, which we regard, the United States has regarded as a terrorist organization. Uh, one of our former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs called uh, the Akhani Network a virtual arm uh, of the ISI. Uh, point two, it's also clear uh, that uh, the Pakistani military and Pakistani intelligence uh, uh, provide sanctuary and support for the Taliban, uh, which is an extremist organization uh, that uh, uh, provided sanctuary for al-Qaeda in the early period. And even recently, uh, the leader of al-Qaeda, uh, Zawahiri, pledged allegiance to the new leader of the Taliban. Uh, so the, the relationship uh, continues. And these two uh, steps that Pakistan clearly has taken, uh, it used to deny that there were any Taliban in Pakistan, uh, when I was ambassador to Afghanistan, when I went to see President Musharraf, uh, and after a long discussion, when I raised the issue of the Taliban with him, he asked me, uh, they're not here, uh, give me their phone number, give me their address. Uh, I had to remind him that the leadership of the Taliban was called the Quetta Shura, which, uh, you know, it's a big Pakistani city, and there is also, there was and uh, a Peshawar Shura, which is another big city in Pakistan, and the media regularly went and interviewed some of these people. Uh, but in any case, uh, as you know, more recently, uh, he has boasted, uh, Mr. Musharraf, that he did uh, obviously help the, the Taliban and, and the Akhani network. But the Pakistani support for these two groups has been uh, a, a, a critical factor in my judgment in the longevity and successes that these two groups have had against the United States, against our forces. We've lost quite a lot of people, as, uh, as, as you know, uh, both uh, military in particular, but also non-military folk. And in, uh, they have imposed huge financial costs by making the war uh, uh, prolonged, uh, and significant, requiring us to invest uh, not only lives, but also resources. And it has imposed huge costs also, uh, both military and civilian on the Afghans. Uh, as those of us who have studied uh, insurgencies and counterinsurgencies, if there is a sanctuary, uh, it makes it much harder, takes longer, becomes more uh, protracted uh, to defeat that insurgency. I'm not saying other factors are not important. They are. I mean, the question of governance, uh, the uh, policies of the government in charge. But sanctuaries make it much harder to defeat, uh, uh, to defeat uh, insurgencies. So uh, it seems to me that our policy, as if I would uh, characterize it as one of, uh, of engagement, providing support, sometimes withholding some assistance, uh, uh, but one of 
assistance has not produced what we had hoped would be the result in Pakistan, which is that they would change policy uh, to bring the Taliban to the negotiating table and move against those Taliban that uh, are not reconcilable or would not reconcile, and then also to move against the Haqqani network. This has not happened. So as a nation, in my view, it's uh, important that we debate what to do next. And I believe that we need to consider a different policy uh, among our options. And the policy that I think is uh, worthy of consideration is one of uh, increasing the cost of this policy to Pakistan. You know, typically, when you dis want to discourage uh, bad behavior, you have to uh, do things that uh, look like punishment or, uh, or imposing costs uh, uh, to, to shape uh, a response. And Pakistan has believed so far uh, correctly that they can get aid in billions and get support and continue to do these things and that we would not confront them with the choice of either you take our assistance or, uh, and you can uh, stop what you're doing or uh, there would be no assistance. And I think unless we affect fundamentally that calculus, uh, that the, they will confront a choice, uh, it's unlikely that they would, uh, that they would uh, adjust the policy uh, that uh, we require, uh, that the Afghans require, and indeed the, the world require. I would, uh, 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 I welcome some of the recent announcements by the administration and some of the actions, such as the drone attack against Malam Mansur in Pakistan. I think that sent a, a strong message. Uh, I believe that the, the administration's effort to isolate Pakistan, to pressure it more, is welcome, but I think it's not insufficient. We need to do more. And uh, more, in my judgment, is uh, one, uh, we need to uh, do uh, additional drone attacks against targets that are Akhani and, and Taliban related uh, 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 if Pakistan does not move against uh, the Akhani network and the irreconcilable Taliban. We need to have, in my judgment, very sharply focused sanctions against people in these two institutions, the military, especially the army, and the intelligence network who are involved in support of, uh, of uh, uh, the Akhani network and the Taliban. And that would mean financial uh, sanctions and, uh, in my view, also it means travel uh, to the United States. I, I think we ought to suspend all non-humanitarian and non-education assistance to Pakistan. I, uh, uh, I, I agree with the ranking member that education is very important and we ought to continue with educational assistance, humanitarian assistance, but non-education, uh, uh, not only our own, but in IMF, I think we need to use our influence there to, uh, to, 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 to uh, make sure that the next package that is likely to come up uh, later this summer, early fall, does not go through uh, without uh, 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 Pakistan taking the necessary measures uh, with regard to these two, two, two groups. I also uh, think we ought to consider, deliberate, debate whether Pakistan should not be put on the list, State Department list of, of, of sponsors of terrorism. Factually, it is. Now, the question is, uh, what are the pros and cons? Uh, uh, and I think there are costs for us not doing this because the whole list and uh, problem becomes uh, loses its legitimacy when a state uh, clearly is doing something and, 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 and we are uh, uh, not calling a spade a spade, and that has its own cost. And I also believe that calling Pakistan a major non-NATO ally, given what it is doing, is, uh, also raises questions of the, of the legitimacy uh, of, of, of such a designation. We ought to signal that without a change uh, on these two issues, we would recalibrate, reconsider uh, 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 that designation. And uh, I would think that uh, we ought to also, as we do with regard to North Korea, a country that has nuclear weapons, but uh, has many uh, hostile and negative domestic and external policies, uh, um, uh, consider uh, at to when we might take the whole issue to the Security Council uh, uh, in collaboration with the Afghans. 
to, uh, to expose, uh, uh, we have not done as much as we could in my view to expose the details of how this policy of support for Akane and for the Taliban have actually conducted uh, 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 by Pakistan and the implications, uh, the ramifications of that, that in terms of the amount of damage it has done to fellow uh, 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 Muslims uh, in Afghanistan, uh, 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 besides the, 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 the killings that have taken place of the coalition forces who are there. Uh, I think also, as we think down the road, given that uh, Pakistan may choose not to uh, respond favorably to this, we need to uh, 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 look at the strengthening uh, uh, cooperation with India on terrorism and counterterrorism uh, uh, and on strengthening uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, 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 that it can be hardened. My judgment is that if we do what the steps that I have described, it is, it is not out of the question that Pakistan uh, might reconsider because I think if we can shake this belief that they have that they can continue to be both the beneficiary of U.S. assistance and uh, can continue to do what they are doing with regard to the Taliban and the Afghani network with the view that eventually will tire out, they will, will get tired, will leave, and then they can go back to uh, imposing a Taliban government on Afghanistan and the uh, good days will be here again from their perspective uh, regionally. Uh, uh, we would have to look at other ways uh, uh, with other, uh, to share our uh, uh, perspective on terrorism, particularly India, and I just was there last week at seri uh, uh, very serious discussions. Uh, I think we would take, uh, we will need to take a look at this. I understand, Mr. Chairman, uh, the final point that, uh, uh, that uh, this is not an easy issue. Uh, uh, the, government, the administration that I was a part of, uh, we tried engagement too uh, 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 and assistance in, in the golden hour after 9-11 when our credibility was high. We didn't push as hard Pakistan at that time as, uh, as we should have. I think another golden hour may have, uh, may have uh, uh, become available after the killing of Mullah Mansour but by itself, it, I think it's in, insufficient. We need to get Pakistan's attention uh, that uh, uh, things are different, that they do need to make a choice, and, and, and I, I uh, recommended the steps that I did for your consideration. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, on the clocks, uh, please look at the amber light and the red lights. I'm not gonna hold you to, uh, this is too important an issue, and. We want to hear everything that you have to say, but we, I know we have a lot of questions up here too. Mr. Roggio. Thank you, sir. Chairman Salmon, uh, Ranking Member Sherman and Keating and the rest of the committees, thank you very much for having us here today to talk about this extremely important issue. Uh, you, you properly asked the question of whether Pakistan is a friend or a foe, and uh, I, unequivocally the answer is, is a foe. Pakistan may combat some groups that threaten it, movement in the Taliban in Pakistan, Islamic movement in Uzbekistan, groups like that that are fighting the Pakistani state. However, they support numerous terrorist organizations, organizations that are listed by the U.S. government as foreign terrorist organizations. In my testimony, I list six, I give uh, list six and, and give a brief description of the activities, but we could list dozens or scores of groups that Pakistan supports in India, in Afghanistan, uh, groups that are designated terrorist organizations, groups that provide aid and support for Al-Qaeda, groups whose leaders serve as the deep bench for Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups when their leadership is winnowed down via drone strikes by, by the U.S. and Pakistan's tribal areas. The, again, the evidence is indisputable. Just this weekend, the Indians killed a Kashmiri terrorist who is a member of Hezbollah of Mujahideen. This is a nasty terrorist organization. And Pakistan, did they welcome this killing? No, in fact, they denounced it and referred to him as a Kashmiri separatist. This is an individual who recruits online for holy war and is recruiting youth and poisoning the youth to, to conduct terrorist attacks. And lest we pretend that, well, this is just an in Pakistan issue, issue 
with Pakistan and Kashmir. It's not. These Kashmiri terrorist groups that have been aided by the Pakistani state base themselves in Afghanistan. I could list groups, Lashkar-e Taiba, Harkat ul Mujahideen, who the State Department said as recently as 2014 is running training camps inside Afghanistan. These groups are attacking and killing U.S. soldiers. And I haven't even touched on groups like the Taliban, the Haqqani Network, or the Mullah Nazir group. These are just s small groups. I, I concur, and for the, bre for the interest of brevity and time, uh, Ambassador Khalilzad's statements on, on the, the Afghan Taliban, the Haqqani Network, I concur with 100%. What the Pakistanis are doing, and they're playing a, a, a fantastic shell game, they have this narrative called good Taliban versus bad Taliban. The good Taliban is any group that the, that the Pakistani likes. And that is, those are groups that don't attack the Pakistani state. These are groups that carry out Pakistan's foreign policy. Haqqani Network, Afghan Taliban, Mullah Nazir group. And then, in the, even in the Pakistan press to refer to this, groups like Lashkar-e Taiba, Hezbollah, Mujahideen, uh, Harkat ul Mujahideen, again, I could go down the list. They're considered, quote unquote, good Taliban as well. And the bad Taliban, they're the ones that fight the Pakistani state. They're the ones being targeted in the Shawal Valley in North Waziristan. When the Pakistanis go after these groups, they pretend that they're going after the Haqqani Network or the Mullah Nazir group or the Afghan Taliban, but they're not. The Pakistanis haven't named a single high, mid-level or low-level leader killed in one of these operations because they haven't killed any of them. They haven't captured any of them. All they are selectively targeting in the interest of the Pakistani state. Um, this, as a matter of fact, this narrative of the good Taliban versus bad, bad Taliban, my website, Long War Journal, has been banned in Pakistan for four years because we've reported on this narrative and it's been a, an issue that I have not let go of and we're banned because if Pakistan has a history of killing individuals that expose these types of, of uh, situations. Uh, Sayyid uh, Shahzad was brutally executed by the ISI for his reporting on links between Pakistan's intelligence service and Al-Qaeda and attacks that were occurring within Pakistan. It's, uh, you know, we, um, Pakistan is not gonna change its calculus. It, these groups that they support, they're doing this because they feel it's their best chance encountering India, and that's why they support them. And I also believe there's an ideological aspect within large elements within the military and intelligence services as well, and this is being reported on. So you have a, this confluence of it helps their policy in India, as well as they get the ideological, you know, radical jihadist support as well. These groups are strategic depth for Afghanistan in case it has to go to war, and it uses them in, in Afghanistan, uh, I'm sorry, strategic depth within Pakistan against India, and it uses these groups also to conduct its policy inside of Afghanistan to target uh, and kill U.S. forces and allied forces. I, we, we have to change our calculus if Pakistan won't change theirs. And I concur with Ambassador Khalilzad's statements. We, we need to, I believe all funding should stop. Uh, we, should, we should put a break on this situation until we can really get a handle of it on it. Money is fungible. If we're funding Pakistani education, they could fund Pakistani militants with the money they're saving. We, may, we have to consider sanctions. We have to consider the possibility of state sponsorship of, of terrorism. Do we, cut, do we limit or cut off trade with Pakistan? Do we restrict Pakistanis' travel to the United States, cut off visas, student visas? All of these options be, should be on the table and unless Pakistan changes its habits and its, uh, it, we're just, we have been enabling the Pakistani state for 15 years now. Nothing has changed and it's only gotten worse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bacon. Good afternoon. It's an honor to appear before you today to discuss Pakistan's policies towards militant groups. Thank you very much for this opportunity. After the terrorist attack on Easter Sunday in Lahore that killed 70 people, Pakistani leaders reiterated their pledge to cease their dual track policy of treating some groups as having utility and going after only those that oppose the Pakistani state. However, unfortunately, the opposite has occurred. These distinctions have grown hardened and the Pakistani state is not willing to reevaluate them. Most importantly, the calculus of the Pakistani army, the primary institution in Pakistan that wields power over these policies, remains unwavering. It's evident that no terrorist attack in Pakistan is large enough to cause them to reevaluate their position vis-a-vis -vis their militant proxies. 
Instead, relations with the four major proxy groups, Lashkar-e Taiba, Jaishi Mohammed, the Haqqani Network, and the Afghan Taliban, will remain a deeply entrenched component of Pakistan's national security policies. Today, I would like to outline the Pakistani security establishment's three-pronged calculus vis-a-vis -vis these organizations, in part because in order to get Pakistan to truly change its behavior, the United States will have to affect all three of these um, aspects of its calculus. First and foremost, as is well known, Pakistan's security establishment judges groups based on their utility vis-a-vis -vis India. This is not simply about Kashmir. This is also about deep-seated fears that India is inherently aggressive towards Pakistan. This extends to Pakistan's support to the Afghan Taliban and the Haqqani Network, which stems from fears of Indian encirclement and a desire to prevent India from expanding its influence on Pakistan's western border. As the military's efforts to achieve conventional parity with India grow increasingly futile and the security situation in Afghanistan continues to deteriorate, Pakistan will remain committed to these policies. Second, the security establishment evaluates militant groups based on how they affect the threat within Pakistan. Though there is extensive cross-fertilization between groups hostile to Pakistan and those seen as having utility, the so-called good militants not only largely abstain from violence within Pakistan, some also discourage other groups from engaging in violence in Pakistan. Breaking ties with the proxy groups runs the risk that they will turn their guns inward, dangerously compounding the terrorist threat within Pakistan. Third, the Army weighs its capability to dismantle and defeat militant groups. Because the civilian institutions are still not capable of truly dealing with terrorism, this task will fall to the Pakistani army. Unfortunately, a, a military approach alone will be insufficient to tackle these four groups and possibly could be counterproductive in efforts to do so. It is worth briefly noting that relationships have evolved, especially since the 1990s, when the army provided extensive active assistance to a number of proxy organizations. This included resources, weapons, training, and even cover fire to enable cross-border infiltration. In essence, it operated in the trenches with militant groups. U.S. and international pressure has shifted the way these relationships function. By far the most important asset that the Pakistani state continues to provide is safe haven and protection. The amount of active assistance has decreased. However, in this current environment, active, the safe haven is also the most important asset that Pakistan could provide for these groups. All four organizations are highly capable and almost entirely self-sufficient other than their need for safe haven. They have other sources of funding and weapons and equipment, as well as sizable cadre of capable and experienced operatives. They no longer rely on the Pakistani state for these things. The Pakistani army did its job well. The remaining asset that they need and that they receive is safe haven. Yet the army's relationship with Lashkar-e Taiba, Jaish-e Mohammed, the Haqqani Network, and the Afghan Taliban have proven resilient. These are the relationships that survived the tremendous fallout from 9-11 in the aftermath. While we have been deeply dissatisfied with Pakistan's counterterrorism efforts, once friendly militants saw Pakistan's co cooperation with the United States as a betrayal, and they turned their guns against their patron. For Pakistan, it has been the worst of both worlds. While the first rationale still dominates, all three reasons, the proxy group's utility against India and Afghanistan, their mitigation of the domestic threat and ability to worsen it, and the Pakistani state's limited ability to confront them, mutually reinforce the security establishment's ongoing relationship with militant proxies and ensure that these ties will remain intact for the foreseeable future. I admit that I am skeptical of Pakistani pledges that they will deal with the quote-unquote good militants once they have taken care of the hostile ones. The bad militants, in their view, are not going away, in part because they work closely with the good militants. In the meantime, the so-called good militants will grow stronger and the Pakistani state will be even more difficult will have an even more difficult task confronting them in the future. I hope that by shedding light on the situation, it will help the United States to better respond and manage the challenges ahead. With that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, this has been very, very enlightening. Um, you know, when I've, I've done town hall meetings back in my district, this probably gets more people's dander up than anything else. And I know when we've had votes on the floor uh, to either defund or significantly reduce the funding to Pakistan, it's always done very well. Uh, most of the voters that I come into contact with wonder why in the heck we give peop uh, people money that actually aid and abed uh, those that uh, uh, commit terrorist acts across the globe. The other thing that I, I've, I've got to wonder, the other countries that we try to influence, don't they think we're a bunch of chumps? I mean, that, that's the other thing that I've got to wonder is, is, is that, 
you know, we're, they see us as being so stupid. And it, it kind of reminds me, uh, you know, I, I wasn't there, but in some of the movies I've seen about how the old mafia used to deal with businesses, uh, come take money from them to protect them, so to speak. It kind of seems reminiscent of that to me. It's like paying the mafia off, but no good uh, is going to come of it in the end. So, uh, Mr. Roggio, you, you, you suggested that we just cut off uh, all funding uh, completely uh, to uh, Pakistan um, and go ahead and move with uh, uh, whatever uh, is required to declare them a state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, and, and then also, um, you know, look at uh, limiting travel uh, for those from Pakistan to the United States and, and possibly even look at trade. Um, I, I'm a believer that if we just cut off the funding, it's not going to be enough. Um, if, if, we, if we just cut off the funding, I, I don't think it's going to be significant enough to them, to the other resources they get from the bad guys. And so I'm wondering, um, why in the world have we continued to pursue this policy uh, of, uh, you know, I don't know, giving them money uh, when we know all the bad things that they're doing? Um, why have we done this policy in the first place? I guess I could understand in the first place why we did it because they, there was some assistance, uh, you know, in the, in the war with terrorism with Pakistan, or with Afghanistan, but now I, I don't understand the rationale. Could, could you or Ambassador, uh, any of you, give me the rationale why, why we're still doing it, do you, and, and what other options do we have right now? Well, I, I, I believe that uh, uh, Part of the reason for uh, continuing to uh, pursue uh, this approach has been uh, uh, the belief, uh, and Pakistanis are very clever in manipulating us, I have to say that, number one. The belief that uh, uh, they are about to change. Uh, uh, you, you cannot uh, believe, uh, uh, Chairman, that so many times that they notice that things are moving possibly towards a change in our policy, then at that time, they take an initiative uh, to, to make it hard for us to then actually go through with it. So they know how to uh, right. And uh, you've noticed recently when there has been, again, pressure on them towards isolating them, uh, they reach out to uh, distinguished members of Congress. Uh, they invite them for visits. Uh, they charm them. Uh, they uh, promise uh, once again. Uh, and even the exact statement from ourselves uh, that are surprising uh, in the face of facts uh, 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 as they are because we are, a, we are polite people and uh, we don't want to insult our host. So uh, I, I think it, 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 the Pakistani ability to, to uh, manipulate by their actions in part uh, uh, has been a factor. But, uh, but, uh, We've but been manipulated by a lot of countries. Yeah, uh, North I, I, Korea yeah. as an example. Uh, it, we, and and I mean, I'll go back to there's a word for that. They're, they're making chumps out of us. They're, they're, we're playing, uh, if I might use an undiplomatic uh, term, we've been patsies. Uh, uh, Patsy, chump, <laughs> yeah, right. idiot. Um, <laughs> well, uh, mo well most, most, most Americans out there see through all of this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. um, and yet, you know, our so-called leaders uh, don't, don't really get it. Um, I can't even contemplate why on God's green earth uh, we even thought for a nanosecond about the F-16 sale. Right. I'm glad that it's been scuttled, but it, it, none of it makes any sense at all. Mr. Rojo, you, you had a comment. Yeah, just quickly. I mean, I, I, I think with the F-16 sales, I mean, obviously someone's going to make money off of that, and there's a lobby in Congress, of course, to, to push sales through like that. Uh, no secret. But I also think that the, a lot of people in the case of the aid that's going to Pakistan do think that it's going to do good. But the reality is, is the Pakistani madrasas are still cranking out thousands upon thousands of potential jihadists who are going to join the Taliban or any of these other so-called good militant groups, good Taliban groups. So whatever we are providing, it's not working. It's not changing Pakistani society. It's not changing Pakistani education. So I, I think there certainly is, I, I understand that we think we're doing good, but in, in, in the end, as you said, they're treating us like chumps, they recognize it, 
and um, and we're more than willing to keep handing out money to Pakistan. So why wouldn't they take it? I I, I just have one other quick question because we've all asked questions and, uh, from the State Department when they've come uh, about Dr. Afridi and what they've done uh, to try to secure his release. And every time it's the same, you know, mantra. Oh, we we talked to him about that. Are, are they doing enough? Absolutely not. They're back. They, Look, he's being held uh, in order to punish the United States for what we did to kill Osama bin Laden. By all rights, he should be a hero in Pakistan as he is here, and he's being held to punish us, to punish him, and to send a message to any other Pakistani willing to help us that if you go ahead and do this, this is your fate. Uh, honestly, I'm surprised he's alive. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. I'll pick up. Right there, Ambassador, what if we cut half of all aid to Pakistan in, uh, until Dr. Afridi and his family is here in the United States? What would be the reaction of the Pakistani government? And uh, do you expect the Pakistani people are going to riot in favor of imprisoning, uh, imprisoning Dr. Afridi? Well, I think that the... Uh making a lot of aid, uh, you said half, uh, conditional, I think, will have more of an impact. Uh, I don't anticipate... Well, it obviously has more of an impact on the feckless policy we've had so far, but right. what will be the reaction in Pakistan to that? The Are they? Yeah, first of all, at, at minimum, maybe they take us up on it. We save a, almost a billion dollars. That but might be a good least, thing uh, for a lot of... Uh, if you don't, they don't take us up, we would have saved some money. In any right, that's the point I'm making. Rest, right. But I think uh, that uh, my experience in dealing with Pakistan is that they would only give you something uh, when uh, they know that they're going to Okay, their, their counter-argument on all this is they can't give us Dr. Freedy because, oh, my God, it'll be some terrible circumstance in their country. Um, if a Pakistani government were to put Dr. Freedy and his family on a plane to the United States today, what harm would that Pakistani leader have tomorrow? No harm whatsoever in my judgment because some of these groups that rise on the street uh, uh -huh. uh, are the groups that, uh, uh, based on long experience, I can uh -huh. tell you uh, that they, they riot with when the they're told to riot. And yeah. they can, uh, they, when gotcha. they, they raise these. Uh, I, want, I want to go on to please. Mr. Uh, uh, Rogigo. Um, the F 16s, they're going to be back. They're going to be asking for them. The argument is that these are the planes best suited to going after the terrorists in the uh, uh, frontier territories. Uh, is there a weapon system that's less expensive, just as good as being a platform to survey and this is lava a missile at terrorists and, and that poses uh, less of a and, and, and would not be useful in going after India, something a lot less sophisticated? Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I would say F-16s are high Advanced fighter planes are overkill in a in conducting counterinsurgency operations. Low tech planes that could loiter over the battlefield and um, deliver munitions. So if they're Super trying to get a, a a plane to go after the Haqqani network, the F-16 is not the right choice. It's not it's not the right choice. We use a, a aircraft like this in Iraq and Afghanistan because it's what we have and what we know. But there is certainly a lot better options uh, available. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, if I might add, if they would arrest first Sarajuddin Akani, uh, that would be an indication that they are serious about going after the Akani network. Well, they move him around themselves <laughs> <laughs> to meetings uh, and provide them with uh, first class well, housing. Well, 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 let it makes me it a little hard to believe that they are, uh, they, they are going to move well, militarily well, against the Akani. Let me network. ask Dr. Dr. Bacon. Okay. Even a second-year law student's read a thousand cases, could recognize when the judge um, is citing an opi a, a precedent correctly or incorrectly. Let's say you, there's a fatwa that comes out relevant to your work at the State Department. Do you have a State Department office that can evaluate whether that fatwa is based on a strong hadith or a weak hadith? Who do you go to? Who knows? Um. When I was at the State Department, I left in 2013, I, there were a number of experts on political Islam. Um, political Islam. But were these people who had read a thousand fatwas and who knew the difference between a strong and a weak hadith, 
or were these uh, Princeton graduates who had uh, uh, studied uh, the history of the Ottoman Empire? There were both. And within the intelligence community, there certainly are a number of people who are experts on Well, go, go, just go back to the State Department. Is there a single person whose job description says they've got to be as knowledgeable about Islamic law and Islamic jurisprudence and Islamic theology as the graduate of the uh, 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 chief uh, school uh, 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 institute in Cairo, for example? Especially when it comes to the countering violent extremism efforts, there's been a number of people who've been brought on to focus Broad, on... Can you name somebody who would know... I am no longer at the State Department, so I would uh, Okay. To who was there two years ago, three years ago? There were several people in um, the Bureau of Intelligence and Research who were brought on for their expertise in Islam, but I don't know who is currently Their expertise there. in Islam, so they've read uh, English books on the history of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Ambassador... Is there anybody who's employed by the State Department who uh, could uh, uh, pass the final exams at, uh, I, I forget the name, uh, Al, uh, uh, what? Azhar? Al Azhar, at, yes. Do we have, I know we got a bunch that can pass the final exams at the highest levels at Princeton. Do we have a single person there that could pass with medium to low grades, uh, uh, the institute I just... I have been out of the State Department now for seven years. So okay, seven years ago, do we have anybody? I don't remember that, that we did. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bacon, if you could provide for the record uh, genuine that there's somebody at the State Department who isn't just a, a Ottoman history buff, but who has read thousands of fatwa, who, know, who is hired because they can know the difference between a strong hadith and a weak, weak hadith, uh, either today or in 2013. That would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. Um, before I get to Mr. Rohrbacher, um, we've just been pinged for a vote on the floor. We have 10 votes, and I don't think we'll be coming back afterwards. So um, if I could maybe get both you and Mr. Keating in. Try. Thanks. All right. We'll go quick. I'll say for the record that uh, the Pakistani government uh, and the ISI created the Taliban along with the, with the Saudis after we left uh, when the Soviet withdrew from Afghanistan. Uh, since that, at that time, uh, um, the Pakistani government was deeply involved with creating that regime that ended up uh, offering safe haven to Osama bin Laden and uh, the, the murder of 3,000 Americans. Let us note when we uh, uh, went to drive out uh, uh, the Taliban, that the Northern Alliance, uh, uh, with our help and our, and our support, drove the Taliban out. Where did they drive them to? Pakistan. Now, where did Osama bin Laden go? Osama bin Laden, the murderer of 3,000 Americans, was given safe haven for almost a decade in Pakistan. Anybody, I don't know anyone who believes that the leadership of Pakistan did not know Osama bin Laden was there, right there in their country, uh, in an urban area. Uh, let us note that when our troops, uh, when our brave uh, uh, special forces went to uh, uh, bring justice to Osama bin Laden, that uh, they had to fly uh, very uh, specialized helicopters so that they wouldn't be shot down. By whom? By Pakistan with airplanes that we'd given them. This is insane. Uh, let us note that Pakistan still holds Dr. Afridi, the man who made it possible for us to identify Osama bin Laden, the murderer of 3,000 Americans, and they hold him in a dungeon today, which is nothing more than rubbing our face in the fact that they can do that and how much they really hate us. Uh, uh, this is a ridiculous that we give any uh, aid whatsoever to a power like that. For the record, uh, the people of Baluchistan are being slaughtered by this corrupt, oppressive regime. The people of Baluchistan have to understand, we should understand, the United States is on their side because they're struggling for independence and, and self-determination from a corrupt, vicious, ter uh, terrorist-supporting regime. Uh, same with the Sindhis. Same with other groups in Afghanistan. So we've got a regime that murders and represses and is corrupt with their own people. And yet we still continue to give them some time for support. It is absolutely absurd. Um, and I, I, uh, 
Uh, Ambassador uh, Khalizad, we've worked together many years. I'm going to ask you a tough question. When the Taliban were driven out of Afghanistan and our friends in the Northern Alliance came in and took Kabul, um, there was a decision to make, I think, in, in Bonn, and I think we were both at Bonn, Germany. The decision was who was then going to be the leader of the new Afghanistan, or at least in transition. I, of course, was pushing for King Zahir Shah, as were a group of us who had supported the Northern Alliance. It is my, remember, is my memory that you and the administration were supporting Karzai. Was that due to undue influence by the, by the Pakistani government on that administration, the Bush administration, as they have had undue influence on all of these administrations? Well, uh, for, thank you for the statement uh, with which I associate myself, eloquently stated, uh, Congressman. Uh, on this uh, question of Karzai's choice, why Karzai was selected, <clears throat> the name of Karzai was first brought up by Abdullah Abdullah, uh, who uh, was the key figure in the Northern Alliance at that time. Right. Uh, we, we, he argued that for the next phase of Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan needed a Pashtun leader uh, that the Northern Alliance could work with, and he thought uh, that uh, uh, Karzai was such a Pashtun. And uh, this was the first time that uh, we, we had heard of Karzai for such a role. And he, uh, Jim Dobbins, my colleague who represented us at that time, and I was in the White House then, uh, reported that. So, uh, uh, but then when we checked with others uh, in the region and beyond, uh, Pakistan did not object to uh, President Karzai's choice, uh, as well as quite a number of others. Let me note for the record that uh, that was a pivotal decision that has led to problems. The problems that we are discussing today, the king of Afghanistan would have been much more independent. He was beloved by his people. He was a Pashtun, and we turned him down. And I honestly believe, like you said, we asked of Pakistan for, for their opinions on it. Pakistan, of course, push for someone they could control, someone who could be consistent with their corrupt, repressive regime, and that was Karzai. Unfortunately, now we face this challenge today. Thank you for your service. Thank all of you for your opinions. Thank you. Mr. Keating, and we have four minutes now before the vote. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, because of the time, I'll, I'm going to just hit one question, I think. Uh, it's one that uh, confuses the public to an extent. Uh, so it's confusion or it's downright obfuscation. Uh, on the part of Pakistan, but that's the role of the ISI. Uh, you know, the assassinated former Prime Minister Bhutto uh, called the ISI a state within a state. So if you could, just in that time frame that we have left, uh, quickly comment on what you think uh, that is. Are they a rogue element there that's not answerable to Prime Minister Sharif? Uh, how far does it go, in your opinion? You have to be brief, I apologize. I will be very brief. It is no, by no means a rogue institution within Pakistan, and it is not operating independently or on its own. It is an instrument and an arm of the Pakistani army, and it is implementing the policies of the Pakistani army. So it's not a, just a few officers, and it's not making policy up. It is implementing on behalf of the Pakistani army. Yes, I, I concur. It, it, is a, it is an arm of the Pakistani military. It is executing the will of the Pakistani military, which is indeed the Pakistani state. The, any, the government is really just the face of the Pakistani military. I concur with my colleague. Well, that's great. Uh, we can all make our roll call. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for your very clear and frank testimony. Now you're back. Uh, I thank the panel. We could go on several hours. You're, you're amazing. I really appreciate it. For the record, um, I personally believe that we should completely cut off all funding to uh, Pakistan. I think that would be the right first step and give that a chance to work. And then if uh, we don't see any changes, we move with some of the other suggestions. Ms. Rojo, uh, state-sponsored uh, terrorism declaration, uh, possible economic uh, sanctions. Um, and I, I, I personally believe that right now uh, we have the worst policy that we could possibly have, and all we're doing is rewarding thugs. Uh, so I thank the panel very, very much. I thank the gentleman, and uh, this committee is now adjourned.